from near San Diego, Carlsbad, California. I'm Andrew Shore from Patient Power. Welcome to this Patient Empowerment Network program. I am so excited. It is really a wonderful opportunity for anybody dealing with lung cancer, whether you're the patient or you're a close friend or a family member, to get the latest information. And you can ask questions and particularly understand this new world of precision medicine and how does it apply to you or a loved one so that you get the right care. It is so important to get a patient perspective. So you're gonna meet a patient who's been in a clinical trial and doing well as we've had this changing world of lung cancer. And we have a whole team from the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. It's one of our leading cancer centers in the world and we'll be hearing how they work together. So let's meet that team. I wanna start with a medical oncologist and that is Dr. Janelle Gray and she is Director of Thoracic Clinical Research in the Department of Thoracic Oncology at the Moffitt Cancer Center. Dr. Gray, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much, it's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we're gonna understand the role of the medical oncologist, but it's a bigger team than that. So I wanna also um, have us meet Dr. Steven Rosenberg, who is a radiation oncologist and works in concert with medical oncology. He's normally down in Tampa, but today, where are you in Wisconsin, Dr. Rosenberg? I'm currently in Madison, Wisconsin, giving a talk later today and tomorrow. Okay, home of the University of Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us. And then there's another member of the medical team none of us usually get to meet, and that is the <laughs> pathologist who's looking at our biopsy, whether it's taken from the lung or now increasingly liquid biopsies, our blood, and we're gonna talk about that. And that is a pathologist, and that is Teresa Ann Boyle, who joins us. Dr. Boyle, thank you for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be dragged out from behind the scenes. All right, well, you won't be behind the scenes anymore. And of course, all of this, we have this whole group, but it doesn't mean anything unless there's a patient that they can help and maybe a family with them. So let's meet a patient from Tampa who's been living with lung cancer for a number of years, Ed Cutler. Ed, thank you so much for joining us on this program and we're gonna share your story. Hi, Ed. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and an honor, to be honest with you. Well, Ed, you know, so you've been living with lung cancer how many years now? Just over five years. Okay, but let's face it, it uh, wasn't that long ago if somebody was told they had lung cancer, they were not long for this world with more advanced lung cancer. So modern medicine has made a big difference for you, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, when, when I uh, received my diagnosis, I was, you know, given the, quote, average, you know, life expectancy statistics, and they didn't look very good. Right. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I went the whole, the whole way. I well, we should mention that for the last couple of years, you've been in a clinical trial, and it's an immunotherapy, and we're going to talk about immunotherapy along the way. We're going to talk about target <laughs> therapies, immunotherapies. The doctors are going to help us understand this whole idea of precision medicine, which means how do you get what's right for you? And you've had some changes along the way, right, Ed? I mean, there you are in Tampa, continuing your work as a tax consultant, I know and been married more than 50 years to Donna, which is great, children and grandchildren. Um, but you've had kind of a journey that's had changes along the way, right? It has been a journey. Uh, you know, initially I started out uh, with standard of care, chemotherapy, uh, and uh, that uh, you know, basically uh, took over 16 months Basically, the first two or three months, I was on the full, you know, the full uh, medication of three drugs, and then they dropped off one, and then I was on maintenance. Uh, but at the end of the 16th month, uh, they discovered that uh, there was a new tumor. And I was told I was now chemo-resistant, and, you know, that was the end of chemotherapy for me. So my oncologist and I you know, sat down and uh, we started searching. 
And uh, there were, at, at that point, I don't think there were any other approved medications. Everything else, I think, was still in trials at the time. Uh, now I know that you know, there are maybe two, three, a half a dozen medications that are out of trials and, and FDA approved. Uh, but at that time, I was you know, limited to clinical trials and uh, you know, Dr. Tan, who was my oncologist, uh, uh, you know, gave me the options looking, looking at two or three different trials. And uh, my, uh, my goal was to you know, live as long as possible with good quality of life. And that's what I was looking for in, in each of the trial uh, descriptions. Uh, and we ended up selecting one and uh, I took all of the various testing to qualify for that trial and, and I was ultimately accepted. It was a two drug combination of infusion uh, and uh, unfortunately I only lasted seven, roughly seven months in that trial. Uh, because of side effects that almost killed me. But now there's another trial. And fortunately, it took a f another few months, but we located another trial uh, that uh, was being performed only at Moffitt. I said, well, that's convenient. <laughs> uh, so uh, I said, yeah, you know, everything looked good on that. Uh, sure, there were potential side effects, but... Uh, uh, I was willing to, to take my chances with it. And uh, here I am nearly three years into that trial. And uh, I've been stable most of that three-year period. There was a little bit of uh, tumor size reduction initially and basically stable you know, the rest of the time. It'll be three years come the end of January. That's such great news. So, Dr. Gray, you have lots of trials at a major center like... Um like Moffitt, maybe you could just tell us, in this world of lung cancer, patients who participate in trials have not only paved the way for everybody, but it's given them great hope, hasn't it? Absolutely. So we have a lot of trials at Moffitt. We try to organize ourselves within a way of doing a personalized medicine approach. And basically that means that any patient that comes to Moffitt, we want to give them the best treatment possible. And many times that is a clinical trial. With clinical trials, a lot of times you have access to more novel agents and things that you can't necessarily get through your regular route through FDA approval. And we also, a lot of that work is spurred by research developed here at Moffitt and partnering with the basic science researchers as well as us at a lot of the clinical, on the clinical side and making sure that we move these drugs forward and into the clinic for patients. And, and Ed, Edward, I just want to say I'm very happy about your your story and thank you for taking the time today to be with us and, and to share your journey with us and well, give us your perspectives you. to this too. Yes, it's very inspiring to all of us. And Ed, we know you're a golfer and so you've been- uh, well, he was. Well, please God, you can do that and travel with Donna. And uh, the main thing is you are with us. Yes. And, uh, and I know that means so much to you and your family. We're gonna talk about the team approach as we go forward. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Rosenberg, um, radiation oncology comes into play here because often when somebody's diagnosed, um, radiation can help shrink the tumors, right? And also uh, alleviate some of the pain and other issues that people may have, right? Yeah, no, I think you hit on a lot of you know, big major points there. And it really is a team approach, particularly at Moffitt, when we approach lung cancer, trying to think about how we can do best for the patients, whether it's a clinical trial or not. Radiation play, plays a big role for patients who have a locally advanced disease. Some of the standard of care is combining chemotherapy with radiation for patients with some advanced disease. But for patients who have had cancer spread to other parts of the body as well, radiation is really good to help alleviate pain and be even improve breathing and the things that are happening. And with newer agents, we often find that radiation may even be potentiating 
the uh, uh, immune effects of some of the new immunotherapy drugs that are out there. And so we're really excited about some of the trials and studies we're doing with Dr. Gray and her team and the team as a whole at Moffitt combining radiation with some of their new both targeted drugs and immunotherapy drugs right now. Wait, let me see if I get that. So, in um, Dr. Gray, feel free mm -hmm. to comment too. Are you saying that radiation can sort of boost the effect of some of these medicines? Yeah, there, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence out there and some basic science that's right now emerging about how the immune system and radiation really um, are so interconnected and how that helps us actually attack cancer by actually um, uh, basically releasing the immune system um, to uh, uh, recognize the cancer uh, in the body. And so by combining that with immunotherapy drugs, we've really found our ability to you know, potentiate uh, some of the effects of these immunotherapies. Most of this is basic science. There are some anecdotal um, you know, case reports out there, but some of the newer drugs that have just come out in the last year or two FDA approved have been after chemo radiation, and we think they really work together well. And some of the newer trials at Moffitt are gonna be trying to combine these things up front. And I know Dr. Gray has been helping to you know, lead that effort with Dr. Uh, Perez and some others within our, within our kind of joint departments here. Yes, absolutely. And so that work um, that Dr. Rosenberg was just talking about was actually developed at Moffitt. So there's a trial out there that's now published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's, it led to the FDA approval of a drug called Durvalumab, which is actually named because the company, AstraZeneca, wanted to add durable responses and add value to patients. So Durvalumab is where the name came from, interestingly enough. And the study, what we wrote was to look at those patients getting chemotherapy plus radiation therapy, completing what's considered standard of care therapy for those patients with that particular type of non-small cell lung cancer, and following this with an immunotherapy agent, the Durvalumab, for one year. And it significantly improved the outcomes for patients. Patients are living much longer when we utilize this method. And now this has become the standard here in the United States, it's working its way through the approval mechanisms over in Europe and through other companies. And I think this has really revolutionized how we approach and treat patients. And we are looking at now, we know it's safe to give them sequentially, and so can we safely and effectively, meaning can we actually improve outcomes for patients by moving these therapies up front? And so it would be giving a lot of therapies together, so it'd be chemotherapy, plus immunotherapy, plus radiation therapy to patients. But at the end of the day, the goal here is to improve our outcomes in a, and still maintain quality of life for patients. Amen. So it's always challenging um, pushing the bar and, and reaching these goals for our right. patients. Right. So Ed, just a little bit more about your story, and then we're going to bring uh, Dr. Boyle into this too as we talk about personalized medicine. So you, when you were originally diagnosed, um, you were... Uh, I think consulting with a doctor about a concern about an aortic aneurysm of nothing to do with cancer. Mm. That, you went to one doctor and then maybe a GI specialist. That's where they found a mass. And then you went to Moffitt and saw a lung cancer specialist. Did I get that right? That's right. Uh, you know, the, uh, the AAA test, the aortic, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm test, you know, was negative. Uh, but down at the bottom of the report in the footnote was that they saw a mass in my liver and follow-up was recommended. So we went from there, I went to my primary care and he referred me to a GI doc and they pretty much agreed that uh, you know, there was some kind of cancer, but they didn't know what exactly. Uh, they uh, recommended that you know I get a PET scan, uh, which uh, Medicare would not permit. Uh, they said you have to have a diagnosis before you can get a PET scan. So the alternative was to have the biopsy. I said, okay, um, but let me get a second opinion first. And that's when I came out to Moffitt and uh, they confirmed everything. I had my, mo my biopsy here at Moffitt and yeah, there was a tumor in my liver, uh, but the biopsy uh, traced it back you know, to my lung. Therefore I have lung cancer. 
Right, and I want to explain that. So, okay, so let's start with Dr. Boyle on that. So, Dr. Boyle, you look at the biology of tissue samples, Correct. or sometimes blood, and so somebody says, oh, I have liver cancer, but it, that just came up where he said, we well, didn't really have liver cancer. He had cancer that originated in the lung, and the biology of it was it needed lung cancer treatment, right? And that's part of what you figure out, right? Right, right, right. And there are actually within the pathologist group, there's different fields of pathology. There's the anatomic pathology where they're looking at the diagnosis. Is it lung cancer origin or is it kidney cancer origin? Um, I'm in the field of molecular pathology. So I'm looking at the genetic changes inside the tumor or in the blood too, and trying to understand what those changes might mean in terms of what would be the best therapy for the patient. I'm also in the lung cancer research field. So trying to better understand all of these immune checkpoints and how can we look at them? Why do some patients respond and others don't respond? So um, pathology is a large field. So, so I'm working very closely with the thoracic department. In fact, um, I belong to them. 50% of my job is with the lung cancer department and 50% is the pathology department. And we found that that was helpful because the, the field is expanding so dramatically. Um, even within every year, there's great advances. And for anyone to keep up with everything is just mm -hmm. too difficult these days. And so we really do all work as a team here at Moffitt. And so Janelle and I talk back and forth, a lot of emails, um, you yes. know, what does this mean with these things? Um, <laughs> so I even consulted them on some of these questions you have. So um, it's, right. it's great. Well, we're we're going to delve into this personalized medicine world, and the doctors will help us understand. We'll understand how it applies to patients like Ed or others who may be watching. So let's put up the personalized medicine slide. So yeah. help us understand. Let's start with you, Dr. Boyle. This whole wheel around the right, what is this alphabet soup there? What is it? Right, right, right. So th this is showing the variety of different genes that can have genetic changes in the tumor. And it's focused on the genetic changes that um, have potential clinical action or proven clinical action. EGFR is probably a, a more familiar one because that one came out first with um, better response to EGFR inhibitor therapy than chemotherapy. And others... Um, have come along, like uh, with ALK, ALK inhibitor therapy works well with MET, MET exon 14 skipping has become important, MET amplification, and yeah, all these are, these, are, these are genes that have gone awry that are driving correct. cancer, right? Right, right, right. And this wheel is trying to pick up on the driver mutations. There's even more genes not on this wheel here that are passengers. Um, other mutations that might have some effect, but they might not necessarily be causing the tumor or driving the tumor, but um, might be worth considering in terms of the therapy. Um, An immunotherapy tumor mutation burden has been something we look at, and there we're looking at many, many gene changes to see if there are more mutations than usual. And when that occurs, there might be a better likelihood of response to immunotherapy. So we're learning more and more every day about all of these genes and more. We're going to define this. I want to go, and Dr. Gray, you can help mm -hmm. us, these kind of big bubbles to the right. So yes. first of all, a myth, all lung cancer tumors are the same. This, this right here says no, right? No, absolutely, yes. That, that, that the fact is that each patient's tumor has a unique biology. And the wheel on the left, I think, really helps to define this, that at the end of the day, when we get a patient, um, we're concerned about, we get a biopsy, get a piece of tissue, send it over to pathology, to Dr. Boyle's team. She's not only looking under the microscope to help us with what's the diagnosis, what's the origin of the tumor, but we also want to look at what is driving 
your tumor. And so how I've explained it to, to patients is in two ways, almost if you, you know, you have a computer that has all these different parts, but at the end of the day, what drives the computer is really that hard drive. And if you open up the hard drive, there's this little piece of, uh, piece of hardware that's actually making everything run. And that's what we're doing with the, with the tumors is going in, into the cell, going, looking at the DNA level and seeing what is turning on your specific tumor. Another way of thinking about it is, is a hub for an airline, for example. So we, we, a lot of us know Delta has a very big hub in Atlanta. If you, but you know, they have a lot of flights that go through there, but if you were to shut down Atlanta, you would significantly impact the feasibility of Delta being able to function. And that's what we're doing by looking at these driver mutations. We want to find what's turning on your tumor and then match that patient to the correct medicine. So if you have the EGFR mutation, I want to give you an EGFR inhibitor. If you have an ALK rearrangement, I want to give you an ALK inhibitor. If you have a MET mutation, I want to give you a drug that targets MET. What I don't want to do is if you have an EGFR mutation, give you an ALK inhibitor. I'm doing you a dis service. And so it is very important. I think you brought up a very good point at the beginning is that the team approach for lung cancer is imperative so that we can all work together to get the right patient, the right treatment at the right time. We're going to look at a graphic for that in just a second. I want to just go over a couple of other things you mentioned. So, um, so somebody might have a lung biopsy, mm -hmm. get some tissue, that goes to Dr. Boyle and her colleagues, yes. wherever in the world you get treatment. And they're taking a look at it to see where in this wheel, what comes up for them. Correct. And then also there's a, in that purple, um, purple bubble there, it says tumor testing can happen at any point. And so we talked about driver genes and yes. Dr. Boyle mentioned passenger genes. Yes. Well, it can change over time, right? Correct. And there's an argument for having testing again at some later time, right? Absolutely. And so with, for example, if you have an EGFR mutation and I give you an EGFR inhibitor, you then have a chance that your tumor can mutate against that specific drug that I'm giving you and you can acquire a different mutation. And so how do I know what's going on? I need to get more tissue or um, I don't know when we're planning on talking about that. This is a good segue into liquid mm -hmm. biopsies. So a liquid biopsy is getting a blood sample from patients and looking specifically, looking again at this wheel, looking at those mutations to see if we can identify them. Okay. And so it is very, very important to keep um, monitoring patients, getting their blood, getting their tissue over time so we can make educated decisions. I, again, you know, just to like relate this to something I think we're all very familiar with is infections. If you keep giving the infection the same antibiotic, what happens? It develops resistance. And these drugs are no different and cancer is no different. It's just, it, we have to stay ahead of the game and um, try to keep trying to outsmart the, outsmart the tumor. Right. So absolutely. I, I've heard many, many researchers and specialists talk about cancer being really a wily enemy. Yeah. Enemy, and, yes. And so you can knock it back, but there's sometimes the survival of the fittest of some cells that have some other property like another yes. gene. So Dr. Boyle, just help us understand this idea of liquid biopsy, because I know over the last few years, um, you know, sometimes there's been a concern, I don't know who does it, whether a surgeon does it, who does it, to get a lung biopsy, mm -hmm. get as much tissue as they can, but you're saying, well, I need more to make other decisions. Where does liquid biopsy come in now? Uh, basically a blood test, to help inform targeted, uh, well-informed lung cancer care. Right, right, yes. Pathologists always want more tissue, but now we have an alternative, and sometimes an alternative that gets a result faster back to the oncologist and the patient, and that's, that's the blood testing, and it has less risk than taking a sample from the lung. Now, the interpretation of the results from the liquid or the blood specimen is a little different than the interpretation from a tissue specimen. And when you get a positive result from the small amounts of cell-free DNA circulating in the blood, you can really count on it. And the oncologist can treat the patient with a the targeted therapy based on that. There are times when 
the results are all negative and you don't know if the results are negative because there just wasn't enough cell-free DNA in the blood or because the tumor is truly negative for all the mutations being checked. And so that, that's where it really is important to follow up with tissue testing. So um, it's been really a great advantage in the field to um, be able to test with a specimen that, that, that's much more easily available and can be tested right away. I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to um, tour foundation medicine back in Boston mm -hmm. area and also be in some labs at other hospitals. And um, I'm amazed at these super sophisticated analyzers now to try to see what's going on, whether the blood or the tissue. Okay, so there's that whole area, Dr. Gray, on the mm -hmm. left where it says other. And I know that Dr. Boyle and her colleagues around mm -hmm. the world are trying to say, well, are there driver genes that we just haven't identified yet? And you keep having these analyzers looking at yes. more and more, bigger, 100, 200, 300, whatever. But, um, but some people, and I think this was Ed's case, there wasn't a driver gene right. that was identified. Well, what do you do there? So one of the things that we're testing for in addition to these driver mutations is also looking if patients may be a better candidate for immunotherapy and looking at a marker called PDL1. It's program death ligand one, which can be found on the tumor tissue cells. So most patients will undergo simultaneous testing for both the immunotherapy marker as well as one of these driver mutation markers. So if we're unable to find a driver mutation, but we're able to find that the tumor is positive for PDL1, that then triggers to us as the medical oncologist that, hey, we need to kind of shift and let's focus on getting the patient immunotherapy. In particular, now with the approvals and the trials that we participated in here at Moffitt, as well as at other centers, that really, if you have lung cancer, you don't have a driver mutation outside of having a specific rationale why you shouldn't get immunotherapy. Really, you should be starting on immunotherapy. I just want to make, within that setting, I just want to make something clear. There are also some patients where you can find a driver mutation and you can find that they're positive for the marker for the immunotherapy. And how do you choose between the two? For right now, most of the data points to, toward that you should focus on treating the driver mutation, that that does take precedence over the PDL one the marker for immunotherapy. Okay, so really, and I know there's a lot of commercials out there and a lot of excitement about immunotherapies for get very good reason, but I would reserve the immunotherapy in those subset of patients who have both markers to maybe a later line of therapy, but that also gives you a, a backup plan, right? It's to your point, you're always trying to project and, and sequence things for the patients as much as we can. So it is helpful to do both markers up front and then act accordingly. I want to make a point that um, some people, it's the minority, but it's still a significant group, don't have non-small cell lung cancer. Correct. They have small cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this has been tougher. But my understanding, and Dr. Gray, maybe you can inform us, that at some of the latest meetings, you've been learning that immunotherapy, along with chemotherapy, can make a difference for people with small cell lung cancer. Is that yes, right? yes, that is absolutely correct. So in the, at our recent World Congress on Lung Cancer meeting, now this is our global international meeting for lung cancer, where all the lung cancer experts get together on a, now on a yearly basis. A lot of that has to do with that so much is changing that we now need to meet yearly. We used to meet bi-yearly. One of the key presentations there that was in the presidential symposium, so you know that's the big session there, was looking at combining chemotherapy with immunotherapy versus giving in, um, chemotherapy alone. And when they looked at this in patients with newly diagnosed, what we consider extensive stage, or most people refer, may refer to it as stage four, small cell lung cancer, that those patients derived a, a bigger benefit if we did the combination therapy. So we're talking about going from two IV infusions now to three IV infusions. So you do add an hour, but the benefit, there's significant benefits um, that we all feel is also clinically beneficial for these patients. If um, you happen to have small cell lung cancer 
and you are on chemotherapy, there is also data that following your chemotherapy, that utilizing immunotherapy in the subsequent line can also be helpful. So these data are showing us consistently that immunotherapy is certainly effective in small cell lung cancer. And thank you for raising that point and that distinction. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna, Dr. Rosenberg, I'm gonna bounce this off of you as a cancer specialist, not particularly about radiation, but let me see if I get it right, because we're talking about immunotherapy. When I develop cancer, and I've actually developed two blood cancers, so I'm living with it, but whatever the cancer is, our bodies let us down, right? Our immune system has let us down, and we're starting to create aberrant cells, right? And they can develop masses like Ed had, and it can spread as a certain biology that um, the other doctors were talking about that they try to target. But with um, immunotherapy, that's trying to leverage our immune system to do what it didn't do right the first time. Is that right? Is that the way you see immunotherapy? Yes, very, very much so. One of the things that kind of define cancer is its ability to evade the immune system. In terms of our normal body, the way our immune system is set up is set up to go around our body and take care of any precancerous cells and try to destroy them. And unfortunately, what cancer does, it has molecular mechanisms to try and basically get around these things. And so the immunotherapy drugs that are out there help release the break in terms of the immune system to go back and attack these uh, cancer cells. And in terms of the uh, interaction with radiation, because I am a radiation oncologist and I tend to bring it back there, is that what radiation can help do in that setting is actually destroy some of the cancer cells and kind of release what we call antigens into the bloodstream or the nearby tissues to hopefully help the immune system better recognize the cancer. And when you take the break off the immune system and then allow the immune system to hopefully better recognize the cancer cells, these things all work together moving forward. And so I think there's, you know, only moving, only as we move forward will we see more interactions with radiation and the immune system. And even these targeted therapies, I know that, you know, we went over, you know, Dr. Boyle, Dr. Gray talked about how uh, these new targeted therapies that are out there, but even from a radiation point of view, we're now uh, really pursuing uh, radiogenomics, where we're actually using some of these genetic signatures actually to determine how cancers respond to radiation treatment. And we're actually sculpting our radiation to actually target certain areas of tumors to higher doses or lower doses based on some of these molecular mechanisms. And it's a really exciting time, and Moffitt particularly is really pioneering both of these areas to kind of push the boundaries of science right now. Well. Good for you. And I think, Ed, in listening uh, with this new age of cancer care, it really argues wherever possible for people to get a second opinion at a major center like Moffitt, where this brain power and leading edge of research can be brought to bear. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. No, no question about it. Uh, I do have a question for, for Dr. Boyle. And, and that's going back to the wheel of the, uh, of the mutations. Uh, when, go back to 2013, when, when I was diagnosed, uh, were all of those mutations tested when I had my biopsy, or has the state of the art evolved such that now, now they do test for all of them, or are there still some that they don't test for until a certain event occurs? Right. So there is still some disparity about um, where you go for your care and how many genes are tested. Um, certainly Foundation One has a very large panel of genes, um, and I believe that was available in 2013. Um, at Moffitt in this past year, we validated a 170 gene panel that tests both the DNA and the RNA at the same time so that we can detect um, fusions like ROS1 and ALK at the same time as we're detecting EGFR, KRAS, BRAS, all things on the wheel. And so, I mean, that only became available this year. Um, in the past, it was more piecemeal. And so that there were certain things that could be tested early on and possibly more things tested later. More and more, we're doing more comprehensive testing early on at diagnosis so that we know more at the beginning. 
I think there's a point to underscore here is the field is evolving. The other day, Dr. Gray, we did a program that included someone you know from Harvard, mm -hmm. Dr. Sequist. Mm -hmm. and, and her advice, and I think you'd echo it, is wherever our audience gets care, you want to get a broad panel testing. And as we're hearing from Dr. Boyle, the panel's uh, increasing. Uh, but the, the downside, and I know patients like this, for instance, with one of those more rare driver genes, ROS1, where they were tested sequentially and given, as you said, the wrong therapy yeah. for a while until they finally got around to doing the right test and knew what was going on and yes. what's right for them. So I think for our audience, wherever you get care, and certainly it happens at Moffitt, you want a broad panel. And as Ed was getting at is that panel is expanding. Yes. What's going on for you? And I think what you all say in personalized medicine is the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, exactly. let's go to the role. We have another slide that describes the role, really the um, team medicine approach, if you will. And let's take a look at that. So, um, so okay, so Ed was referred to Moffitt came there for a second opinion. And uh, so let's see how it goes. So Ed, was the first place you went was to an oncologist? Was that first stop for you? That's correct. Mm -hmm. okay. I went to a, G, a GI oncologist. A GI oncologist, but then it was discovered that it was really coming from your chest um, and there was testing done. So. Um, Dr. Rosenberg, let's let you lead it. So here I see radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, uh, way down at the bottom, we have molecular uh, uh, pathologist, like we have Dr. Boyle. How does all this work together? I think, you know, you're going to hear this theme over and over again about it's really a team with all of us, you know, especially as, say, we meet to go over patients at, you know, weekly tumor boards, which includes both our medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, surgeons, our pathology colleagues, our radiologists, it's really all of us together. And so as we gather information from a new patient, we're trying to really determine what their stage is, usually first of all, based on imaging, and then you know, trying to establish a diagnosis through the tissues that we've gotten. And once we kind of have that information, we can meet as a team and kind of come up with a comprehensive treatment plan. And that includes gathering um, not only the tissue information, but the molecular information that Dr. Boyle really helps us put together there. And after we have all that information gathered, then we can kind of go down these different paths, uh, depending on what stage the patient has, what their molecular drivers are, and what sort of clinical trials and opportunities we have available for them that fits them in a very personalized way, which really goes back to that personalized medicine that you were talking about there. Dr. Gray, any comments from you about this wheel? No, I, I completely agree with what Dr. Rosenberg summarized. I think we're, at, we're a big referral center at Moffitt Cancer Center, and many times um, patients may come in with a biopsy. And I wanted to just touch base with what was mentioned before about getting enough tissue um, when you do do biopsies to work up for the lung cancer. That is very important, and I think this wheel here and this summary here helps to highlight that, that we really want to get down to the point where we're really collaborating with the molecular pathologist, looking at your biopsy within the lab, and perhaps getting that circulating tumor DNA analysis in the blood also to make this decision. And I fully concur that this is a team approach. You know, we really need the pathologist to let us know what's going on. We really need to sit down as a team and make sure that we all come up with the right the right decision for the patient. And that's certainly one of the benefits of going to a place like uh, you mentioned, like Harvard and coming to the Moffitt Cancer Center, certainly also. Right. So Dr. Boyle, uh, so there are people listening who maybe have had a biopsy somewhere else, maybe at the community level. And here you've got this big lab and you have, uh, you know, other groups that you work with, with huge analyzers and pathologists and all that, that you work with. Um, somebody says, well, if I come to Moffitt or, you know, any other major cancer center, sometimes the request is made to have another biopsy or other tests. Why is that important today? Because do you have sometimes where maybe the initial analysis wasn't as correct as it could be? Right. It's really the bane of our existence. Uh, people like to say the tissue <laughs> is an issue. Um, it, 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 
and it goes along with the, the um, if you don't have an adequate specimen, you can only get so much information mm -hmm. out of it. The, the, the blood testing has, has really helped alleviate some of that pain. But um, when, when um, a procedure is going to get a small bit of tissue from the lung, it, it can be um, less than 100 cells. And we're trying to do the best we can to learn about 100 tumor cells. So um, that, that's, that's why the biopsy is so important. And I was thinking maybe, maybe we can go around the wheel. Uh, we are missing the surgeon in here, but I, lo I love this particular appearance and, and how you can go around and around and around. Um, but but uh, patient usually first comes in and sees their oncologist and then a biopsy can be taken uh, and it goes to the anatomic pathologist and they determine is it adenocarcinoma or squamous cell cancer, small cell, um, or some other primary cancer. And then the specimens inevitably get um, the genetic testing. They go to the lab and that's where we come in. We're looking, what's the tumor cellularity? Is it enough for us to even test? Can we test with the targeted small panel if it's not enough for big next generation sequencing panel? Mm -hmm. And we get we do the sequencing on our big fancy machines, but we get the results. And it really requires pretty intensive interpretation to understand the results and make sure that we're reporting out accurate results. Yeah, I wanted and, to get to that. There's a, I wanted you to speak to that. There's an art to pathology. There's an art to medicine, yes. of course, but there's an art to pathology. And so you want to give um, accurate recommendations of what are we dealing with to the medical team, the rest of the medical team, and that has an art to it, right? And in in, in you're a, a subspecialist in that area. Right, and we don't want to overwhelm the oncologists with too much information either, so we're very receptive to feedback about what's most important for actually taking care of your patients that you're seeing. And um, the resistance mutations have become very important. We used to only check for one part of the out gene, and we got feedback from the oncologist that that wasn't good enough. They need to look at all of the out gene for resistance mutations. So that, that back and forth. And then we also have the help of the personalized medicine group here at Moffitt. Um, and that's wonderful. They have farm D degrees. So they know about um, the drug side effects. They know how to work with insurance companies. They know how to answer questions about what's the functional effect of genetic changes. So when we sign out a report, it goes straight to the oncologist, but it also goes to the personalized medicine group for a more in-depth look and um, maybe some help identifying clinical trials that the patient might be newly eligible for based on the genetic findings. And the radiation oncologists have become more involved, too. As Stephen was talking about how the genetics can, can um, play a role in, in, in the care in terms of the radiation. There's more and more clinical trials um, that um, we're getting involved in together to um, better understand what, what's the best therapy. So, Dr. Rosenberg, what I'm getting from this is <clears throat> a patient might see Dr. Gray or see you, or maybe a surgeon with earlier stage lung cancer as well. Um, but that there's this whole group, uh, Dr. Boyle, but she rattled off a few other groups as well. They're all behind the scenes. And you guys are talking about me, the patient, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, we, you know, we are really in communication with each other. Uh, on a pretty regular basis as a team. And I think that's, that's what really leads to this personalized care for the best outcome for the patient is really being very communicative about between Dr. Gray, um, Dr. Boyle, between the surgeons that we work with, and just everybody really working together to try and you know, make the best decision we can for each patient and gathering all the right information up front. I think that's really the key is making sure we have all the right information we need, whether it's molecular or imaging, before we go down a certain path so we don't go down the wrong path for any particular patient. And uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, as we kind of put that information together, we can help really personalize each person's 
care that way. And uh, we're using, from a radiation point of view, we're using both the imaging information that we're getting and the molecular information to help make radiation decisions. And at Moffitt, we're really trying to push those boundaries from imaging as well. You know, we talk about personalized care from these molecular changes, but you know, uh, Moffitt this spring will be opening up our MRI guided radiation treatment unit, which is uh, one of the first in the country. There's only a handful of places that are doing MRI based radiation treatment and that's really another form of personalized care by you know seeing somebody's anatomy up close in a very particular way and designing the radiation in new <coughs> based on individual anatomy and so uh, with that better imaging we're able to do that so there's a lot of ways to personalize care for our patients moving forward so dr gray i want to talk mm -hmm. about the spread of cancer so ed talked about how he had this on his liver mm -hmm. But it come, you figured out, we yeah. all figured out it came from his lung. Uh, lung cancer can spread, cancer can spread generally. But here we have people with metastatic cancer mm -hmm. who are living longer yes. with some of these approaches, radiation, immunotherapy, therapy. target therapy. therapy. So Therapies. when you tell somebody, Mr. Jones, yes, you're right, imaging, we see your cancer spread. Mm -hmm. That's not the end of the story. Absolutely not, no. So what we also look at are these genetic findings, the pathology findings, the markers for the immunotherapy. But at the end of the day, what your goal is, is to extend life and to add quality of life to patients. And so as we look at this information, we want to make sure that we're making the right decisions. And this is, this is the goal, ultimately, of personalized medicine. Yes, your cancer may have spread, but we can give you treatments that are going to knock down the cancer, get it to shrink down, and to a point that sometimes they become undetectable on the scans. We do think that there are cells still circulating there, but we can still continue to follow you and keep track of the cancer and make sure that you're, we're helping you to manage this uh, properly. Okay, so I want to remind our audience, send in your questions. This is an Ask the Expert question. We have an expert patient who's lived it, and I know, Ed, you spend time talking to other patients and family members. We have Dr. Boyle, and we got her out of her lab there, you know. <laughs> you, uh, you might not see her in the exam room, but she plays a key role. We have Dr. Rosenberg, who's uh, even traveling and joining us in Dr. Gray. So if you have a question, send it to um, lung at patientpower.info. And I wanna uh, tackle a question. Here's one we got from Greta. What percentage of blood biopsies are accurate? She said, I had one done and it showed I no longer had the BRAF mutation, but subsequent tissue biopsy showed I did still have it. So how reliable are the liquid biopsies? And I think you, Dr. Boyle mentioned that a little Hi. bit, but so this is a new area of pathology in, in this area. How much can you rely on it? Right, so, so um, the positive results we are finding when, when you're testing with a reputable company, um, they are, can be very reliable, just as reliable as the tissue testing for the positive results. And um, there are some advantages even because in the body, you might have tumor in the lung that's a little bit different from the tumor that spread to the liver, whereas the blood is a big mixing bowl. And if you have some DNA sloughing off the two different tumors, that DNA is mixing in the blood, so you're getting a more comprehensive look at the mutations in the blood. One big, big disadvantage that's represented in this question is when you get a negative result. When you get a negative result, like she got for her BRAF in the blood, it's really a non-informative result as opposed to a negative result that you can hang your hat on because you don't really know how much cell-free DNA is actually sloughing off the tumor and circulating in the blood. And so if it's not, in the blood, you might get um, a negative result when really it's still BRAF positive in the tumor, as she found when, when she had the tissue tested again. But this is evolving, right? I mean, we couldn't even talk about liquid biopsies not too long ago. So the sophistication in the sort of uh, getting down almost nano, the nano level, mm -hmm. you're working right. on it, right? And the actual utility, Janelle and I have talked about this mm -hmm. so much. 
yes. with algorithms for, for how to really understand the results and, and use the results. And, um, and, and this is something that at, at Moffitt we, we know well about the negative results being more like non-informative results with the blood. And we, we, um, we find them very helpful when we interpret them appropriately. Okay, well, that, there, there we go to the art and the sophistication of the tools that continue to develop. It's a lot of computing power, folks, that go into this. Uh, and then the wisdom of folks like Dr. Boyle. All right, here's a question we got from Greg. I think this is for you, uh, Dr. Gray. What is happening in research for those of us who do not have target therapy gene mutations and also have a low tumor burden? Is chemotherapy the only option? No, so if you look at the studies that have occurred so far and looked across the patients that have a low tumor burden or have a negative PDL1 or have no actionable or driver mutations, we still know that chemotherapy plus immunotherapy is the way to go. We're also doing a lot of research in that setting is that once those or if those stop working for you, what are going to be the next steps? And that, I think, is certainly an area of need. One of the things that we're looking at is combination immunotherapy strategies that perhaps giving you one immunotherapy therapeutic agent was not enough and you perhaps need two. We also, you know, I think that chemotherapy is still very important and doing combination strategies down the line with some of these novel agents. When we look at some of the, a lot of the trials, even the ones that, where you give chemotherapy with immunotherapy, if you look at the data, most of the benefit up front, for now at least, appears from the actual chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is very good at reducing disease bulk. Um, but the immunotherapy can then come in and activate, help to activate your immune system. And the ultimate goal of immunotherapy is to create immune memory, okay? Almost along the lines of a vaccine. You know, you get your flu vaccine once a year because it mutates. You get your hepatitis vaccine. You're not getting it every year. You only get it for a sequence. And the purpose there is that your immune system should be able to sustain on your own. And we want to do that for patients up front. That would be the ideal. But we also recognize that we just, this is very new and we don't know enough. So I think expanding more on combination immunotherapy strategies, looking at novel agents, looking at where chemotherapies target also and probably repurposing those drugs a little bit so that we can actually hit the target even better than regular systemic chemotherapy and reducing toxicities. There is a plethora of, of research going on within all avenues. So the, I think the key thing there is that if you have something and it's not working for you, you know, come to a, a center of excellence uh, like Moffitt Cancer Center and, and sit down and talk to us and so we can let you know. And, you know, exactly to your point, we talk to physicians all across the globe, you know, work very closely with Dr. Sequest at Harvard. We share patients, um, share data constantly. Even if we may not have something for you here at Moffitt, there may be somewhere else in the United States that we can, we can send you also. So I would not, I don't think the key thing there is that giving up um, should not be the first option by any means. Amen. I just want to drop back for a second, make sure everybody understands this whole world. Dr. Rosenberg talked about a little bit. So the immune system let us down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Dr. Boyle a while ago used the term checkpoint. So yes. Dr. Dr. Gray, I'm going to see, let you be the professor here, see if I get a good grade, is... <laughs> Um, the cancer cell has this kind of protective world yes. around it where medicines traditionally maybe don't, don't kill it. Correct. Right? Correct. Okay. So, so what the immunotherapies are doing, maybe more than one, mm -hmm. is to knock down that barrier so yes. that whether it's with radiation, like Dr. Rosenberg talked about, with these immunotherapies mm -hmm. where your immune system can do its job in can killing the cancer cells, the yes. abnormal cells. And you also alluded to something else where the immunotherapy can continue to do this surveillance yes. wherever the cancer may be, whether it's spread to Ed's uh, liver, yes. whether it's gone to somebody's bone, wherever it is, it says, oh, now I see you. And yes. guess what? Bad news, I'm going to kill you. Kill right? you, correct. 100% right. So how is it, I, one of the ways to think about this is that the immunotherapies, if you see the commercials out there, for example, for Opdivo or Keytruda, they actually 
they, they do not kill the cancer cells. So this is very different than chemotherapy. Traditional chemotherapy we're very used to goes in, actually kills the cancer cells. Exactly. This is unmasking. The immunotherapies are unmasking the tumor to the immune system, allowing the immune system to now recognize the cancer cell as foreign and then attacking the cancer cells. And exactly, your immune system should then sustain on its own. And that is the ultimate goal of immunotherapy. And Ed, that's what you've been living with, right? You told, you said earlier, you're stable. So you're taking immunotherapy and it's kind of knocking it back, right? Yes, it is. Uh, I, you know, to what uh, Dr. Gray said, uh, you know, with, with respect to, I guess, first line of treatment with, you know, the combination of chemo and immunotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, what what is the standard now mm -hmm. with so, that combination? Is it Olympta, Avastin, and then yeah. Truda or Updevo? So right now, as of you know, 2018, what is approved by the FDA? I'm um, just going back a little bit. Remember, there's two main types of lung cancer. There's small cell lung cancer. There's non-small cell. There's two main types within non-small cell of a non-squamous type of lung cancer and then a squamous cell type lung cancer. And to Ed's point, he's completely right. Your chemotherapy that we choose for you depends on your type of lung cancer. And I think that's what you're alluding to in the question. Yeah. So yeah. there are data that has shown for non-squamous, non-small cell lung cancer, if you combine carboplatin plus pemetrexid plus pembrolizumab together, that is the FDA approved regimen for first line for that type of non-small cell lung cancer. Now, if you have uh, non-small cell lung cancer, the subtype is squamous cell, the drugs that are approved right now are carboplatin, paclitaxel plus pembrolizumab, or you can substitute that paclitaxel for something called nabpaclitaxel or a braxane. Paclitaxel um, can cause some infusion reactions in patients, and so the, the nab paclitaxel is formulated to minimize that infusion reaction. So there's some flexibility there, but they're still in the same class there. So, and then if you have the small cell lung cancer, actually the regimen that is approved there is a platinum, so cisplatin or carboplatin, plus etoposide, plus atezolizumab. So it's really, even within that spectrum, these are all ways of personalizing medicine for patients and really having that level of information from the pathology and the biopsy side so that we can make the best decision for the patients. Okay. And then having, when that data comes in, is having that expertise about which one is going to be the right for which patient. Right. But there's one other aspect I want to put on. So mm -hmm. for patients, whether you go to Moffitt or another major center, rather than some of those names she mentioned, there may be a clinical trial yes. where it has a number and it says, we're going to give you X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four. That's what yes. we recommend, which hasn't been approved, but they believe may offer a better option for you. Did I get it right? Yes, correct. And so we call them license plates, right? So when they <laughs> license plate numbers. And so when the drug first comes out of drug development, um, it kind of gets this license plate number and, Nivolumab, pembrolizumab, all, you know, all of them came out with these license plate numbers, as we call them. And then you just, as they move forward and they show promise that they then develop, uh, develop a more formalized name, nomenclature for the naming. But you know, to your point, it is very important to also look at uh, clinical trials within that setting. That's how we make these strides. That's how we make these improvements. We participated in a very first trial with nivolumab here at the Cancer Center, and I still have a patient that is alive six years out. You know, his daughter was five when I met him. She's, she's 11 now. He was on some, they sent him to hospice on the outside, um, and I said, you know what, we're going to try this medication, and he has not received the immunotherapy in four years. And this is a perfect example where his immune system was able to work get the tumor down, and now it's sustaining on its own off therapy. And if he didn't come you know, to Moffitt, he would have just been sent to, to, to hospice. Mm -hmm. So this is where exploring, making sure that you explore all of your options is very, very important. What I always recommend, you know what, can you get treated locally? 100%, but at least go in for that consultation. Make sure that there's not something newer, more novel, something that we think may be a little bit better. 
clinical trials is always a way to explore things. At the end of the day, the standard of care FDA approved therapies are always there and we can always give them to you whenever. You may have this option for this trial. And I think my patient got one of the last slots on the trial um, nationally. Anything? Wow, what a, what a story. I just want to recap a couple of things for our audience. Okay, so you got it now about personalized medicine mm -hmm. and getting what's right for you, whether it's one of these targeted therapies in this growing list of genes that Dr. Boyle has mm -hmm. talked about and drug companies and government working to develop things that match up with that. Immunotherapy, maybe more than one, some that have a commercial name and some that have a license plate like Dr. Uh, Gray just described. And so, um, and then this whole idea of radiation oncology where Dr. Rosenberg and his colleagues are finding out how does all this work together? How can radiation actually trigger something in a cancer cell that then also helps it say to the cancer drug, hi, I'm here, boom, they get hit by a cruise missile, right? So that's what they're working on. All right, we got a bunch of questions. Remember, lung at patientpower.info. This one came in from Leo, and Leo says, any new research or treatment regarding patients with the TP53 mutation? So first of all, Dr. Boyle, what is TP53? <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, oh, I I don't know off the top of my head know how that spells out, but it is a tumor suppressor protein. And it's one, it's a gene which we find frequently mutated in all cancer types. And it um, often causes a, a worse prognosis. And there are many researchers trying to see if there are better drugs to target therapies and lung cancer, the clinical trials are pretty early. It's as, as high as you get as um, phase one, two. Um, so there has not been a lot of success yet. In leukemia, I think there's more phase two trials. Uh, we, we have an excellent researcher here, Elsa Flores, who is looking at animal models and um, in vivo studies to try to understand more. Now, one thing sort of interesting about TP53 is that if you have a lung cancer with uh, a TP53 and a KRAS mutation, that patient is going to be more likely to respond to immunotherapy. Um, there's, there's a really nice paper out by John Haymack about this. Um, if there's also an STK11 mutation, though, then um, there's a lower likelihood of response to immunotherapy. So with more and more research, we're learning some of the nuances of these. And we're, we're hopeful that there's going to be more that can be done with the TP53 mutations in the future. Okay, so Dr. Gray, so yeah. you were nodding your head while she's yeah. doing that. So in other words, you're looking at not just one gene being the bad guy, but this constellation in a given patient. And right. Does that tell you something that you could do in a more refined way for them? Correct. Right. Now, this is, I think this is where coming into a, a center where we have this level of expertise and we're sharing data across the different centers. But exactly what Dr. Boyle noted is that when we look at these genomic reports, right, you're getting a lot of information coming uh, out back at the medical oncologist and knowing how to fully understand and interpret that data so you can make the best decisions for the patient is very helpful. So if we see a KRAS mutation, the P53 without an STK11 mutation, certainly that will move immunotherapy up on, for the armamentarium for the patient. Now, this is a little bit in experimental mode, but we've seen similar um, data here at Moffitt, and it's really starting to pick up traction um, across different, different cancer centers and lung cancer experts. Around the, the specific question of the P53 mutation, we do have a compound that we're looking at here in collaboration with AstraZeneca that was, came from a trial um, that I've written and am working on that came from work derived here from Moffitt Cancer Center. It's called AZD1775. But it basically, what it is, it's looking at inhibiting the cell cycle. I'm going to take us back to biology a little bit and, you know, take, 
cells, how they replicate, basically they have to go through mitosis, right? You have to replicate your DNA and then split off and divide. Um, and so what the P53 does is it, it, it's almost, you know, as Dr. Boyle mentioned, it's a tumor suppressor. What does that mean? It actually puts a stop gap, an intentional stop gap, when cells go to replicate. And it makes the cells stop and check and say, do I have any mutations? Should I move forward or not? What cancer cells do is they've lost, you know, they mutate the P53. So they don't get that stop in place. They just keep replicating. Even though technically these are abnormal cells, they're damaged cells, and they shouldn't replicate themselves. So what that drug does is it intentionally incorporates, if you have that P53 mutation, your, your cells are not stopping when they're replicating abnormally. This AZD1775 helps to add that stop so the cells can check themselves and say, hey, you know, we're really not replicating ourselves properly. We should actually go towards cell death and not cell survival and replication. So there are definitely trials where we're looking at the, the P53 to Dr. Boyle's point, including one that was derived here. And you know, as Ed, Ed mentioned, something that you can only find here at Moffitt. And we hope to have that data out maybe later this year or early next year. Okay, stay tuned. Here's a question we got from Jim. How does immunotherapy work in EGFR mutations after targeted therapies no longer work? Do you want to yeah. comment? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one of the key things, as I mentioned before, is if you find an e a mutation such as an EGFR mutation, you go down the realm of the targeted therapy. So staying to treat patients with the targeted therapy is very, very important. I want to take this opportunity to say that you should not combine an EGFR inhibitor with an anti-PD-1 with an immunotherapy. It significantly raises patient's toxicity. So if a patient, if a physician ever, if that ever comes up, at least for right now, um, the answer, you should decline that and no one should be offering that to you. Exactly. Um, so I agree that the best way to, to incorporate them right now is through a sequential approach. So you start with the EGFR inhibitor and there's um, Four of them actually FDA approved right now. So you may get sequenced from one EGFR inhibitor to the next. Um, what people are looking at right now is should we go straight to immunotherapy? Should we go straight to chemotherapy? Or should we go straight to a combination strategy of chemotherapy and immunotherapy? I think based on the data for right now, most of us, um, as long as we think that it's safe, will go to a combination of chemotherapy plus the immunotherapy based on the data. This is gonna be looked at more in detail to finally answer this question. Uh, it also depends on the wishes of the patients too. Um, so it, if you think that you cannot, if a patient cannot tolerate, for example, immunotherapy combination with chemotherapy, we may start with one or the other and then move onward. But definitely I agree that the sequencing is gonna be the best way to do that. Okay, let's talk about uh, toxicity for a minute. So Ed, you had uh, earlier, you had some treatment that was pretty tough to take, right? Yes, yes it was. Uh, the only major uh, side effect you know, that, that impacted me was colitis. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was major. <laughs> it was really, really major. And you had to change, you changed. And you know, when, you know, when I read the, uh, the protocol, yes, that was one of the potential side effects. Right. Uh, but uh, that's all it was, was a potential side effect. I took my chance with it. I'd never had colitis before. Uh, and then it hit me. Uh, and I'm still kind of dealing with that to some extent, nowhere near what I dealt with you know, three years ago. Okay, and your treatment was changed. And my treatment was changed, okay. yes. Here's and a question. That, that was a combination, you know, two drug mm -hmm. combination uh, trial, uh, mm -hmm. phase one trial. Here's a question we got in from Wendy. So this is a little technical, but she says, I'm currently keeping my stage four non-small cell adenocarcinoma FA with monthly maintenance infusions of pemetrexid. Did I get mm -hmm. it? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed in August of 2015. Nothing visible on PET, uh, PET scans, uh, but the chemo has been prescribed to keep the cancer uh, reappearing. And her concern is the long-term damage, she wonders, of getting chemo infusions over a long time. She says, uh, what could be the downside of chemo over a long term, Dr. Craig? 
Yeah, so what are the things that we, well, congratulations. I'm glad that you're doing so well. That's, that's really um, inspiring to hear. And I think that speaks to the fact that there are patients uh, and cancers out there that respond to chemotherapy. And I think that we should still keep that in mind. The long-term side effects that we generally worry about with chemotherapy are how they affect your blood counts. And by blood counts, I'm talking about your bone marrow. So your red blood cell counts, so your hemoglobin, your hematocrit, your white blood cell counts, um, your, leukocyte, your leukocytes, your neutrophils, things that hurt you, help you fight bacterial infections, viruses, and then your platelet counts, things that these really help with your clotting. So if you cut, your, you cut yourself. Pemetrexid in particular, one of the things that we've noted when you keep receiving this treatment in particular over time is that the anemia seems can sometimes be a rate limiting step. So I definitely keep an eye on your hemoglobin and hematocrit. But I've had patients on these maintenance therapy agents for many years. A lot of times what I will do to lessen the burden for the patients, normally the drug is infused as an IV infusion over 10 minutes every three weeks. I will go to once every four weeks so that you're only coming in once a month for a treatment to add more to quality of life. And then I'll start increasing uh, the frequency of the scans to less frequent. So maybe quarterly you'll get a scan instead of every six weeks. So hopefully all these scans can help lessen um, the burden of the infusion and also help to improve quality of life at the end of the day. But I would certainly be careful of watching the blood counts within the setting. Dr. Rosenberg, related to toxicity, you referred earlier about MRI guided uh, radiation. What are you doing in the radiation oncology field to get at the cancer but not affect either healthy tissue and also lower the side effects that can go with radiation. People that fatigue and other things that go along with it. And, and all of you have been talking about higher quality of life while you might be living with lung cancer. Yeah, you know, it, it's a great question. I think how we've approached this in radiation oncology is actually by shortening our treatment courses. And as our technology has improved, allows us to give us very small volumes of irradiation with high doses to destroy cancer cells, but also sparing normal tissues. And as patients are living longer with lung cancer, we find that say sometimes they're responding well to chemotherapy or immunotherapy or targeted therapy, but one area is starting to grow. We use this targeted therapy called stereotactic body radiotherapy, SBRT. Sometimes go after these certain small areas that might be not responding appropriately or maybe even resistant. But these are targeted areas that we're irradiating that are very small in volume. That's really helped us limit toxicity both to normal tissues going forward. And with the new MRI-guided treatment program, which is where my focus is going to be, is that by having the, an MRI help us guide our treatment in real time, we can make our volumes even smaller. And by shrinking our volumes and targeting tumors more appropriately, we can hopefully spare normal tissues and actually de decrease side effects long-term for patients. And so again, working with our medical oncology colleagues is that if there's an area of resistance that pops up, there's an area we, we can very uh, precisely target while still sparing a lot of the normal tissues nearby. Okay, precision radiation oncology. Yeah, yes. Okay. And we do that also, and if I may add that, you know, if there's somebody who's on a treatment benefiting and they just have one area that's kind of this rogue tumor that breaks through and becomes resistant, that definitely looping in the radiation oncologist working with Dr. Rosenberg and his team and targeting that specific area can be very effective for patients Okay. before you switch therapy. Here's another aspect of uh, immunotherapy. So we talked about these PD-1, PD-L1 drugs, checkpoint inhibitors. So another area that's particularly happening in the leukemias that I know well is what's known as CAR T-cell therapy, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, where if I get it right, correct me if I'm wrong, you can sort of uh, engineer T-cells to become sort of a targeted therapy. Yes. All right. So where, what about this in lung cancer, Dr. Gray? Yeah. So it's a great question. So one of the, the areas this is really taken off in the hematologic malignancies are these CAR T therapies. The hematologic malignancies are very well defined by specific markers on the cells that are uniformly found across 
different types, so lymphomas, leukemias. In the solid tumor realm, it's been a little bit more of a challenge with finding where to specifically target, and also with, to target the cells without adding significant toxicity to the patients. So we do have a, what's called an ice tea therapy here. It's the immune and cellular therapy. It has medical oncologists on that team, both hematologists and hematologists, and they're working together to help bring what we've learned from the hematology world over to the solid tumor realm. Um, so it's, it's new. Uh, I don't think it's yet ready for FDA approval, but absolutely a very exciting, exciting field. Um, again, the purpose of these is to create these long lasting responses in a, in, with a personalized medicine approach. Yeah, I want to thank Gordon for that question. I think yeah, uh, we question. hear about, you know, you mentioned TV commercials or we see an article in the paper and we say, oh, how does it apply to me? Or um, should we get on a plane and go somewhere because they're trying to set? It's, uh, it's really tough. So um, Dr. Boyle, you see this changing field. What would you say, knowing what you know in going on and identifying new genes, if you had a family member, and I hope you haven't, but if you had a family member diagnosed with one of these conditions, what advice would you give them? Because you're on the inside, or maybe you have mm -hmm. friends or neighbors who call you up, oh my God, we got this diagnosis, what should we do? What's sort of an operating system for patients and families today? What, do you, what would you say? Right, well, one thing I want to echo is what Janelle was talking about earlier with the clinical trials. Um, you are getting the optimal standard of care plus whatever new innovative potential therapy um, might be available with those trials. And there actually is um, a better outcome with the participation in the clinical trials. Um, they're very carefully designed. So I would, I would want a family member or a patient, um, it's, it's the same, um, to get as much information as possible and like Janelle said, it, it, it's fine to get your care locally, but um, to get a second opinion at the um, most advanced um, center available to you for a second opinion, get more information, see what's available, consider clinical trials. Um, uh, sometimes just following the basics, like if you have an EGFR mutation to get an EGFR inhibitor therapy and not be wanting, say, immunotherapy. It, it, it's um, just because it's the newest thing. Um, but that's um, what I'd be thinking about. And, and, and getting the rapid care can be important, too. Um, one thing I wanted to add on to what Janelle said earlier about the TCAR conversation is that we also have a trial here with the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. It's not, by definition, a, a TCAR trial, but it's in lung cancer. And they're um, basically taking lymphocytes out of tissue and growing them up in cell culture and reinfusing them into lung cancer patients in the hopes that the reinfused cells will, will um, attack the, the tumor. And I, I just think this is amazing progress that, that this is being tried in, in, in lung cancer too. Here's a point I wanted to make, and that is, so I hope what all our viewers get, and I think we have some pretty savvy questions that have come in, the field is changing. And uh, so, you know, Dr. Gray, I'm sure when you went through your training, um, there wasn't always a lot to talk about with no, that. That's very true. And now we have people like Ed who are living longer, living pretty well. There are side effects we talked about, Ed was talking about trying to limit that. So the quality of life goes along with living well and living longer. But there's a lot of progress being made and you and your family have to be plugged into that. And yet, Dr. Boyle just referred to that, don't get excited about something just that you see on TV, because it may not be right for your specific situation. And Dr. Gray was warning about that too. If you have EGFR, that's not the time for immunotherapy. Right? Correct. Even Correct. though you saw the ad of people in Times Square, New Hope for lung cancer. On highway. Yes. Yeah. So you really have to uh, you really have to think about that. Um, so 
testing, broader panel, second opinion, team approach. Yes. We've got a wonderful team here. Um, here's a question that we got in. We just have time for a few more questions, but Helen asked this question. Is there any research or anecdotal information on how much the drug Olympta adds to the efficacy of another immunotherapy, Keytruda? Does it continue to be effective indefinitely or does it only work for a while? Dr. Craig? Yes, yeah, so there's a recent study called the Keynote 189 study that combined pemetrexid, carboplatin, plus pembrolizumab. So pembrolizumab is the immunotherapy. The pemetrexid is the chemotherapeutic agent. And they treated those patients with the pembrolizumab up to about two years. Um, the study was published and it was found to be positive in the sense that it improved patients' overall survival. So how long were you going to live? And also what's, what we consider your progression-free survival. How long did it take your cancer to actually progress to the point that we would need to switch your therapy. So it was longer in that triplet group than just giving the chemotherapy group. The, you ask a very good question. These are the questions that we also within the lung cancer field are asking, how long do we really need to give these therapies for, especially when you're giving them in combination with immunotherapy when the goals of immunotherapy are to create long-term memory. We have studies looking at giving immunotherapy for one year. We have studies con continuing the immunotherapy indefinitely. We have studies looking at giving the immunotherapy for two years. Um, I think outside of the stage three, in the stage three setting, the clear data is that you give it for one year. Outside of that, I still, I still think that it's still a, a toss-up. My suspicion is that you should at least probably go beyond one year if you can and see if you can't get to the two-year mark. That's where most of the data is uh, at a minimum. I actually have a patient now coming up on her two-year mark in February of this year on pembrolizumab, and I've started having those discussions with her, and it's an open discussion. Uh, that, you know, this is what the data shows. What do you feel comfortable with? And so I think there needs to be a shared decision-making process within this realm also and what the patient feels comfortable with and what the data helps to support. So I think keep having those conversations, especially if you're getting it combined with the immunotherapy. And hopefully there'll be more to come definitively. Just for historical perspective, if you look back many decades ago when chemotherapy first came out, we used to give chemotherapy for a year. Then they, they did the trials where they actually looked at it a year versus six months. Um, the, the outcomes were the same with giving it over six months. And then they went from about six months versus about three months of therapy and now went back a little bit, but added the maintenance in. And so there's definitely these trials will come. It's just going to take time. The immunotherapy, the world of immunotherapy is very novel within the realm of lung cancer. And so we have, you know, there's, we have lots of growth to do, but fantastic question. That's probably one of the things that we sit and debate at our meetings very frequently. So as we come near the end of our program, I want to get some final comments from our panelists. I'm going to end with Ed because Ed, I want you to talk to other patients and family members. But what I get from this is the field is pretty rapidly changing, whether it's in radiation and how that applies to other therapies, whether it's combination therapies, sequential therapies, uh, duration of therapies you were just talking about. With Dr. Boyle, it's about identifying new genes or combinations of genes and trying to figure that out. So what do you want to say to a patient audience? I'm going to start with you, Dr. Rosenberg. So again, we have people all around the world and they or a family member has been given what's a pretty terrifying diagnosis. And it's, it's, it's a scary time as they're you know, facing this. And actually, what I'm talking about here in Madison is about actually putting together your medical and emotional team as you're uh, basically facing this new diagnosis. And I think that's the big thing is putting together a team and being someplace where you have the support and you feel comfortable and also seeking out multiple experts to try and come up with the best plan you can moving forward. And I think as Dr. Boyle, Dr. Gray, as the panel's all alluded to, seeking that Second opinion, just to at least know what all your options are and are available to you is really important. You're building your treatment team, which includes so many different experts, both that you're going to meet in person and behind the scenes. And I think that's the real key aspect of this. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for what you do. And this cool area you were talking about, about having radiation 
um, trigger a response in the cell that can make it more responsive to new medicines is really great. Good luck with all that. Thank you. Dr. Boyle, so you are a CSI detective. <laughs> you are. You have like a magnifying glass. I love my job. You, know, you have much more powerful tools than that. But are you, you're a sleuth. So do you, are, are you confident that this field is, will continue to expand to really unlock these secrets so you can say to these other team members, hey, I think this is what we're dealing with, and here's the key pressure point to go beat that cancer? Yes, yes, I'm very optimistic. Um, when we validated this 170 gene panel, we did not even know if we would be reimbursed, but we did it anyway because we have so much optimism that it will have value and show value. And and um, I, I really feel like understanding the cancer better is a key to better therapy. And my um, thinking is, is that patients should hold on to their hope throughout yes. their whole experience and stand their ground, know what they want and don't want, and, and ask questions to their oncologist um, if they have questions, because there's a whole new world here, and we're, we're all trying to figure it out together as a team, but um, we really appreciate the input from the patients as well. I, I think that's helpful to um, helping all patients and future patients as well. Well, I want to thank you for what you do behind the scenes as far as we patients and family members uh, see you, but, uh, you know, with your colleagues around the world, continue to make these discoveries mm -hmm. so that the therapies can be targeted or more broad, but whatever they are, know what we're dealing with so we get what's right for you. Dr. Boyle, thank you for being with us too. Dr. Gray, so mm -hmm. you have these partners here. Mm -hmm. and you have patients and family members who are your partners too. And as I alluded to earlier, in your own career, you've seen a lot of change. Yes. Is this a message of hope? And are you comfortable that more of us, even now we're talking about small cell lung cancer, mm -hmm. where there's progress being made that can extend life? I'm very hopeful. I think that we have completely revolutionized how we treat patients treat lung cancer and treat the patients battling lung cancer. You know, we're, we're with you there right along, um, helping you with that fight. And to your point, you know, I, when, when I first started doing this, I literally spoke to patients about chemotherapy. That's what I had to offer. Um, and it was just trying to make that selection process about which chemotherapy I thought was going to be right for you and helping you to helping with sequencing. Okay. We're going to start with this and then we're going to plan for this and we're going to plan for that. And the game has completely changed, I think, with the genomic profiling. It is extremely important. We really have to go to these broad-based panels up front. And for right now, I just want to emphasize, tissue is the gold standard, but I, I really think that circulating tumor DNA is something that we can certainly, we've made a lot of significant progress in and can identify these mutations. As you identify these mutations, checking them longitudinally over time to see how they evolve is going to be very important and that will help us continue to personalize treatment. At what point do you pivot from a targeted therapy to a clinical trial, to an immunotherapy, to a chemotherapy? And all of these things come from sitting down, looking at the scans, looking at the patient, looking at these molecular reports, getting everybody on the same page and then making, again, I think having a shared decision model, just making, setting, what are your goals? What, do, what are your hopes? And, and then making sure that we match that as best well, as we can. get tested, folks. Yes. Have your family member get tested and then raise the question with your team, do we need to be tested again? Yes. All right. Absolutely. And, uh, and really, and then I think, Dr. Gray, I just want to underscore a point she made about your goals. Yes. So Ed thinks about that. And Ed, I'm going to give the final comments to you about speaking up for yourself. You know, where, how do you get the care that's right for you? And how do you want to live your life? I mean, you and Donna want to do some more traveling, right, Ed? I hope you can. We've been very fortunate. Uh, no question about it. When, uh, when I first got my diagnosis, I was devastated. Uh, I thought my world was going to end and you know, in a year. 
Uh, but I started talking to my doctors, started talking to other patients in similar situations, and I found that, you know, yeah, there was hope. Uh, I had put together a bucket list, and uh, you know, I found that you know, my bucket list uh, wasn't going to be limited to a year. So I expanded my bucket list, and now it's, uh, it goes on you know, <laughs> at least 10 years out now. Uh, and I'm very hopeful of that. Uh, as I said, I've, I've spoken with a lot of patients uh, uh, here within Moffitt, around the state, uh, around the country, and some internationally, you know, through uh, uh, support groups. And we help each other. Uh, we, you know, we cry on each other's shoulder and we tell each other our problems. And uh, somebody has, you know, an experience that they went through and, you know, might be helpful to another patient. Um, I think it's very important to you know, open up your heart and, and open up your ears and your mind and listen to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't just look at what you read on the internet. Who knows what the truth is, what you read on the internet. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, uh, I don't know. It's, it's not necessarily factual. Uh, but, you know, I think if you talk to your, to your doctors, to, to your team, and your team doesn't include just your doctors, it's, it's your nurses, it's uh, the nurse's aide, it's the uh, social worker, it's the, uh, um, uh, the nutritionist. All of these people can be very helpful, you know, for just about everybody, you know, who, who has, you know, a, a, you know, an advanced diagnosis. Um, well said, and I just want to, we have this medical team here that represents some of those others that Dr. Boyle mentioned, the personalized medicine people, the pharmacists, you mentioned social workers. Before we have to go, I wanted to give you the chance, if you want, to say thank you to these folks or what they represent on behalf of patients. What would you want to say? Uh, I'm just so thankful to every person that I've dealt with here at Moffitt. They have made the process, uh, if not the simplest thing in the world to deal with, pretty darn simple anyhow. Uh, my doctors have, have explained things to me that uh, I didn't even know how to ask the questions in some, in some cases. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just been wonderful. I've become an advocate for Moffitt. Uh, I talk uh, to people in the community. I go to Tallahassee. Uh, with a group of people and uh, talk to our legislatures about funding for Moffitt. Uh, I'm participating in the Miles for Moffitt next month as a volunteer, not as a runner, uh, <laughs> but uh, as a volunteer uh, to help raise money for Moffitt to find, if not the cure, at least uh, the way to extend someone's life with good quality. Well, and I thank you all for that. We wish you all the best. I want to say to our audience that could be anywhere in the world, I think the lesson of what Ed is saying is go to a center where they're knowledgeable to at least get a second opinion. Dr. Boyle had mentioned that earlier and connect with a team like this. And then when they help you and you're given higher quality of life, hopefully, and longer life, then go to bat for other people, whether it's with your center, like Ed has, or in his state, speak out, because you can help a lot of other people. I try to do that, too. One, one other thing, Andrew. Uh, I have another thank you. And, and well, it's actually two other thank yous. Uh, first, to my wife for being a great support. Uh, and second, to the man who had the vision to make Moffitt reality, mm -hmm. and that is H. Lee Moffitt, who uh, at one point in time was the Speaker of the House of the Florida Legislature. Uh, 
Uh, it was his vision. Unfortunately, he had cancer, and that generated, you know, his his vision. Uh, but he's he's still going strong, and he's still, you know, he's still working very hard for for this institution. Well, I want to mention then, lastly, that we can all make a difference. The doctors making a difference, patients, family members in that collaboration and in helping others. I want to thank everybody for being with us today. There will be a replay. There will be a downloadable guide to help you with some of these specific things you can do in terms that can be explained that are sometimes we've talked about a whole alphabet soup here today of mutations and checkpoint inhibitors and, oh my God, hard to keep it all uh, mm -hmm. straight. And also what will help us do future programs is if you participated today or even with the replays, you will get a link to a survey please participate in our survey and that will help us get funding so we can do future programs for you. I want to thank Dr. Gray, Dr. Rosenberg. I want to thank Ed. Remember, knowledge can be the best medicine of all.